Thank you, Kip. All right. Today, we got to cover a lot. So turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes, basically chapter 2. We're going to be a few verses before that and on. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so we got to hurry because we're going to test the entire world today. Uh, we're going to try it all, and the title of today's message is The Grand Worldly Test. Uh, that's the message, the title. Last week, we began our look at the book of Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, and needless to say, it's not exactly the most encouraging book in the Bible to look at, and yet it's so meaningful and wise. It's just blunt. It just tells us what needs to be heard. I mean, the title of the message last week was, By Itself, Life is Pointless. Boy, that's encouraging. I really worked hard to make that as, you know, a Joel Osteen moment there. But anyways, boo. All right. Not very encouraging at that, and yet there's so much truth in it because it points us to where our real joy lies and where our real fulfillment and hope lies. It's in our Lord and Savior. But this idea that life is pointless by itself is truly the observation that King Solomon, purportedly the wisest man in the world according to Scripture, this is the, the observation that he came to. This was the conclusion he came to. He recognized that all that man does under the sun in this life, this side of glory, cannot change the outcome. We all end up in the grave, and we in our works, and the memory of us in our works vanishes from the memory of the then living generation, like a vapor in a wind. He even recognized that nature was subject to this futility as we looked at in Romans chapter 8. It is like all of creation is on this great big cosmic treadmill, always running but really getting nowhere. We looked at how this futility is a result of the fall in, in Genesis chapter 3, and then we looked at how God will accomplish redeeming a part of His creation, the part that He wants to through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that he will restore all things to the fullness of the measure that he intended for them to be, which ultimately is for his glory. So it is at this point that we find ourselves today simply with the conclusion of this one man, King Solomon. And today, as we forge our way into chapter two, we're going to see how he came to this conclusion. He did a little experiment where he intentionally, so he says, tested the things of the world that we normally associate with bringing us fulfillment and lasting joy and happiness. It's a lot of the things that we pursue in futility. Now, we already know the results of that test. He just came out and said it in chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, he tells us. But Solomon knows he knows that we will not believe his conclusion unless he reveals to us his testing protocol. We've become wise in this life. We're shrewd consumers. We've learned not to just take anybody's word for anything. We want proof. How did you come to this conclusion? We want to know. And yet we are still bombarded uh, by unsubstantiated claims in this consumer-driven culture that we live in. Our product lasts longer. Choosy moms choose Jif. Our customers get 20% better mileage. You know, if you're smart, you don't really buy any of that stuff because you know better. You know that we can, you, you can rig a test, you can rig a survey, you can rig a, a poll to say whatever it is that you want it to say. But when someone shows us, when we see it with our own two eyes, or if it comes from a person that we find trustworthy, it tends to go a little farther with us today. So today in chapter 1, verse 12, Solomon's going to restate the problem. He's going to give us his credentials. And then in chapter 2, he's going to show us his experiment, his grand worldly test. He does this so we will not write off his conclusion that all is vanity as just one guy having a real bad day at the office. That's not what this is, okay? 
Uh, he didn't have a bad day at the office. He didn't come home to a nagging wife and screaming kids and unpaid bills and said, oh, this is pointless. No, this was a lifelong experiment. He wants us to see that this is a result of a lot of study and a lot of observation and an experiment that, that made up most of his life's work. So let's look at the problem again. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. There we go. Verse 12 through 18. And this is what he says there. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge, and I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I realized that this also is a striving after the wind, because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Interesting conclusion there. Solomon was all about wisdom. He sought wisdom. He asked God for wisdom, and he was granted wisdom, and yet we're going to see here that he did a lot of foolish things, and we see that in Kings and Chronicles. What we're going to see in this next passage is that in his wisdom, he set out to find out about all the things that a man can do under the sun, things that you might be pursuing right now, looking for some kind of pleasure, some kind of lasting fulfillment. And so he set out to, about all these things a man can do under the sun, including foolish things, to give us his final poignant conclusion. What he came to see in, in, in verse 13 there, if we look back, is, is that it's a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. Okay? So this life and all these things that we're always chasing, it's, it's grievous. It's, a, it's an unfulfilling, sort of annoying, always frustrating, never satisfying existence given to us by God if we pursue it only apart from from God. Adam was given the perfect existence, but by his sin, we ha all we have is this grievous existence under the sun. At the end of the day, when all has been considered, he realized that what was crooked, what was corrupted by the fall, could not be straightened. I remember when I first started doing carpentry work, especially on my own projects, I always wanted straight boards. <laughs> you ever looked at the two by four bin at Lowe's? They don't exist. You know, he came to realize that, you know, and what was lacking and missing in this life, it couldn't be counted because it wasn't there. It was all a vanity and it was all a, a striving after the wind. Even wisdom of which Solomon was the great champion of, okay, that proved to be a striving after the wind. Now, verse 18 is a very poignant verse. Because it says there, it says, Because in much wisdom, in much wisdom there is much grief. And increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. When we increase in knowledge, we begin to realize that there is a whole lot wrong with this world. I have to curb my news watching. I don't have television, but online. I just have to curb it because it drives me mad at how corrupted this world is and how cruel humanity is, okay? We're, we're Memorial Day. We look at, at, at war and the, the casualties of war, and here we are with this Pollyanna idea that somehow we're making things better when the last century, the 20th century, was the bloodiest century by far known to man. Things are not getting better. We might have iPhones. We're still wicked. We're still evil. Okay? 
So with increased knowledge, we begin to realize that there's a whole lot wrong with this world and this life and just about every aspect of it. Then wisdom increases with this knowledge. You realize with wisdom, ultimately there's not a whole lot we can do about it. There's not a whole lot we can do about it. We cannot protect our loved ones or ourselves from all disease and tragedy and strife. We wish we could. You know, uh, Lori and I have, have rightfully earned the title helicopter parents. We don't want our girls to get hurt, and yet we know in wisdom there's nothing we can do to stop it. Okay? Uh, it's a frightening thing. Brings me to our first point here. Increased knowledge tells us there's an awful lot wrong with this world. Increased knowledge tells us that there's an awful lot wrong with this world. It's fallen. It's fallen from creation. Okay? Increased wisdom tells us that there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Increased wisdom tells us that there is not a whole lot we can do about it. Okay? Does this mean we give up? Is this fatalistic? No. Let me get there. Okay, we'll get to that point. But increased knowledge tells us there's an awful lot wrong with this world. Increased wisdom tells us there is not a whole lot we can do about it. It was seven years ago and one day, it was May 26, 2011, Lori and I lost our little Brooklyn. Our, uh, our baby was stillborn. And I sent this message out to my then church family and just other people Um, And it says this, it says, Dear church family, thank you for your prayers. Brooklyn Elizabeth Woods never left the hands of God. She never had to know the wickedness of sin and passed quickly through this world into her eternal home and the glory of Jesus Christ at 8.55 a.m. Lori is okay, but we are heartbroken. We trust in God's sovereignty and know that heaven is much sweeter today. Hold loosely to the things of this world. What matters is what and who is in heaven because of him, Pastor Eric Woods. The fact of the matter is, is when I wrote that, I meant it. Little Brooklyn never had to know the weight of sin. She never had to feel the ache of betrayal and rejection. She never had to be bored with this life or wonder if she is pretty enough or skinny enough or or smart enough. She never had to feel the pain of a scraped knee or chemotherapy or losing a loved one. Through the limited knowledge and wisdom God has given me, I have come to know that this is true. I've come to know that this is true. She experienced the burden of this fallen world through her death, through her passing, but she did not have to dwell upon the face and the surface of this fallen planet. You and I do. You and I do. Our kids do. This is the world we are raising our kids in. In a much darker setting, During the Holocaust of World War II, many of the Nazi guards would tell the prisoners in the concentration camps that they were just going for showers, when in fact they were going to the gas chambers. Many of the adults were wiser than that, and they knew what was about to take place. But many went along with it for the sake of their children. For the sake of their children. How much pain and grief must a mother have felt to tell her child that it would be okay, that they were just going to take a shower when she knew the truth. When she knew the truth. It's a grievous task that we've been given all the days under the sun. I know that may seem extreme, but it's true. Getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, we're not going to get there today, but in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 16, Solomon comes to this conclusion. He says, in the end, how the wise man and the fool die alike. How the wise man and the fool die alike. There's really no lasting hope in this life apart from apart from the hope of eternal life through fearing God and keeping His commandments in obedience to a faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, who did 
who did just that, who gave us, who came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly, ultimately in heaven, ultimately in heaven, not on earth. Through his perfect life, his righteousness imputed to us, and his atoning work upon the cross that he made for dying, the, 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 the righteousness and the justification he gave us by dying on the cross, and the victory over sin and death in the grave purchased for us by his blood, that's the only place we have hope. It's there in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can do anything in this world. If you don't have that, you have nothing. It's vanity. It's a, it's a chasing after the wind. You will never catch it. And yet people still try over and over and over again to find lasting fulfillment and joy in this life apart from God, which brings us back to Solomon's grand worldly experiment. Now before we dive into this experiment, let me give you a disclaimer. He got carnal. He got carnal, and though I want to show you in a tasteful manner how far he was willing to go in pursuit of pleasure, I by no means want to seemingly glorify his choices, his lifestyle, or his carnality. With that said, let's take a look at it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. This is what it says. He says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. So what is Solomon setting out to do here? Okay, he's going to test the world. He's going to test the things in the world we would normally associate with bringing us happiness. So we think. So we think. He's going to start out with the general principle of pleasure. Now, pleasure comes in many forms, and it's obviously one of the chief aims of our lives. We, we pursue it, whether we realize it or not. What we do more times, uh, more times than not is in a pursuit of pleasure. It's hedonism, okay? The pursuit of pleasure is hedonism. We go shopping, okay? We go shopping because new stuff brings us pleasure. We watch television shows and movies and listen to music because entertainment brings us pleasure, uh, Even the work that we do, we usually, not always, but usually do it because we think it is a pleasurable and a worthwhile pursuit. If you're in a dead-end job and you don't feel that way, you continue to do it because you think at least it'll give you the purchasing power to buy pleasure. That's what we think. Um, We want to do stuff and, and wear clothes Okay, uh, we want to sit in chairs that feel good to us. We want to eat stuff that tastes good to us, or the opposite. We, we, we eat stuff that doesn't taste good, that's good for us, healthy, because we want to feel better or be skinnier or whatever it is that we do, because we think being skinnier will bring us pleasure. Okay, I rejected that notion. I love bacon. <laughs> you know, that's just how it is. We want to eat stuff that tastes good. We want to listen to music uh, and listen to people that say things to us that sound good to us. We want a room with a view. We want art. We want scenery. And we want spouses that look good to us. We don't want a house downwind of a pig farm or of a city dump. And we don't want our spouse to work at the pig farm or the city dump because that just smells bad. We want stuff that smells good. Okay, we live in a pursuit of pleasure, fulfilling our five senses that we learned about in kindergarten. Okay, that's what we do. So let me ask you this question. Is this a bad thing? No. Yes. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. It depends on what reason you're looking to those things. Okay, so it brings me to our next point. Good or bad 
we were wired for pleasure. Good or bad, we were wired for pleasure. Let's take a closer look at pleasure. I want you to see the various stages of life going through this progression uh, of pleasurely pursuits. And I'm going to try and point them out to you along the way. Let's start off with folly, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. He says there, I said of laughter, it is madness. And he says of pleasure, what does it accomplish? And yet I see so many people pursuing it that I'm going to give it a go, okay? I'm going to see if there is something there at that party, at that comedy club, is there something there that I'm missing? And I don't mean just give it a go. I mean I'm going to go all out. We're talking partying all night like a crazy rock star. That's how Solomon did this, okay? Okay? Verse 2, he says, uh, uh, verse 3, he goes on to say, he says, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under the heaven the few years of their lives. Okay, I would call this stage right here, these first three verses, I would call this kind of adolescence, okay? It's just, just mature enough and smart enough to get into serious trouble. This is the college stage, Erica. Don't go there. Okay? It's the college stage. It never ceases to amaze me how many young folks associate their future in college, or how many of us older folks, uh, their past in college, mostly with partying. Mostly with partying. Countless movies have been made on the subject. It's the source of news stories, and unfortunately, it's the cause of many tragedies. Death by drunk driving, death by alcohol poisoning, there's date rapes, gang rapes, the list goes on and on and on. Now, I admit, Solomon, he's a little bit nerdy about it, okay? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine. Really? Do we believe that? Okay? At the same time, I've never been ceased to amaze at all the new ways people think they can get high. But he says, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine. Some of you are probably thinking back to some of the wild parties that you, you threw or that you went to for yourselves, and you're thinking, yeah, right, this Old Testament Bible guy, he doesn't have anything on the crazy parties I went to. Who are you kidding? This guy had more money, more resources than you have ever dreamed of having. And he did this night after night. He had the biggest comedians there. The latest bands were there. The biggest celebrities. There were fashion models. And he had a food spread that you could not even imagine. You can't even imagine what these parties were like. So let's just look at the food alone for one of Solomon's parties. Um, it's kind of small, but if you look in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 20, it says, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore in abundance. They were eating and drinking and rejoicing during Solomon's reign. Okay? Verse 22 through 23, Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores of meal. I'm not sure what a core is, but it means a lot. Okay? 10 fattened oxen. 20 pasture-fed oxen, 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and, fowl, and fattened fowl. That's his provision for one day. One day. Verse 27, it says, Those deputies provided for King Solomon, and all who came to King Solomon's table, each in his month, they lacked nothing. He had 12 deputies, and they were all assigned a month. It is your job to provide for me and my folks and my people uh, for the whole month. So he had these deputies, and that was their job. You know, we throw a bring-your-own-meat party. Or if we're generous, we go to Costco and stock up the deep, deep freeze to feed how many people? 10, 20, 30? I got a couple coming over to our house tomorrow. So given the approximate size of an ox to a cow, how many people can you feed with 30 oxen? Think about that. You know, a hundred sheep, a whole slew of chicken. That's a lot of people. 
That is a lot of people. These were each and every night, Times Square, New Year's Eve, blowouts. He ate, he laughed till it hurt, he drank his fill, he did not hold anything back. This was one of those, where did this tattoo come from and, and who's Sheila? <laughs> this was the kind of partying he was doing. And, and after a while though, what did he come to the conclusion of? The parties were empty pointless, futile. How many people today struggling with addiction have come to realize that the partying was pointless, destructive, futile? We laugh at it a little bit, but it's a really serious thing. Getting up at noon with a hangover got old. Did he enjoy himself? You betcha. But did it last? Nope. It was time for him to grow up it was time to get things done and make a name for himself other than wild child. So we move on to the next stage of life. This would be the career. This is after uh, college, okay? This is Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4. He says, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees, I made ponds of water for myself, which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasure of men, the pleasures of men, many concubines. This is the stage of life we know as the profession, professional stage. We get done with college, we try and break into our careers, and by our 30s, hopefully, we have arrived. Okay? We've upgraded from the dorm room to the apartment, now we own a home. We've let the bicycle go to rust. We bought a used car and drove it until it broke. I'm still driving that one. And, and now we've gone out and got ourselves a shiny new car. The one with leather and satellite radio and navigation and sunroof. That's our puny life. That's our puny life. Let's take a look at Solomon's. What I want you to understand is this. It took Solomon, it took seven years for Sol in Solomon's reign to build the temple of God, which is one of the ancient wonders of the world. We're talking ornate, luxurious, beyond anything we could ever comprehend. Okay? Uh, and he built that. He had ornate scripts, uh, sculptures, inlaid gold. It was phenomenal. But in comparison to the temple of God, it took him 14 years to build his house, to build his palace. It was phenomenal. It was luxurious beyond anything we could imagine. And that was just the main house. He had others. He had the beach house and the mountain house and the suburb house and the downtown house. He had it all. Oh, yeah. He had houses for 700 wives. No wonder the guy was insane. We landscape our backyard, or in my case, we dream of landscaping our backyard, okay? He built parks for himself, okay? We plant a little herb garden or a vegetable garden. He plants a forest. We install an automatic sprinkler and a drip system. He dug lakes and built dams to water the forest. So, so what are you thinking of doing with the back 4,000 acres? That's what Solomon did. He bought male slaves and female slaves, and their kids had slaves, and their slaves had slaves. What does that mean to us in our world? I want you to think remote control. Remote control. He didn't have to do anything. He woke up in the morning, and there was someone there to give him a bath, another to shave his face, another to pick out his clothes and dress him. Breakfast was already cooked. Uh, uh, the coffee was already made. If he was hot, there was someone there to fan him. If it was cold, there was already a, a fire being lit. As he set his mind to his work day, his deputies had already been hard at it for hours, accomplishing hours and hundreds of work, uh, hours of work and productivity in his name. It was already happening. 
He had several horse ranches and several cow ranches and several dairy farms. He had gold and silver and all sorts of treasures and art. It says he provided for himself male and female singers. Think CD collection. Okay? He had all of that. And then he had the pleasures of men, many concubines, 300 to be exact, in addition to his 700 wives. He was busy. Okay? This was Solomon's experiment, guys. This was his experiment. Live it up, party in a way that would make a rock star jealous, build an empire that would make Donald Trump feel like a pauper, hold nothing back. If he were in our day, he would have everything. He would have the Learjets, the yachts, the Ferraris. He he says in verse 10 that he did not spare himself anything. If he saw it, he wanted it, and he got it. What was the result? Look at verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. That was it. The good time he had, the possessions he had, all the stuff he did, that was the reward. It didn't last. Okay? It says his name became great. He was popular. I bet he was throwing parties like that and employing that many people and bringing prosperity to the land. He says here that his wisdom stood by him. Well, that's a little bit of a questionable statement for you. We're going to unpack that in a minute. But in verse 10, he gives us a recap. All that my eyes, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold, okay, from my heart any pleasure. Did he have a good time? Yep, he sure did. Okay, he says, my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was the reward for all my labor. What was the reward? The pleasure itself. That was it. And it's fleeting, It was just the pleasure that he experienced for that short little time while it lasted until it was gone. So apart from God, this brings me to our next point, apart from God, the fleeting temporary pleasure is typically the only reward we get for all that we do on the earth. You know, the fleeting temporary pleasure is typically the only reward we get for all that we do on the earth. Verse 11, he says this. He says, Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity. All was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. He had a good time. He had a good life. We would all think that about it at the end of the day when he's an old man. He goes, it was pretty pointless. It was pretty pointless. I love Hawaii, okay? You know, I went once right out of high school. I went a second time for our honeymoon. I went a third time for our 10th anniversary. I had a great time every single time. It's been 13 years. I want to go again because the great time that I had last time has worn off. It's worn off. I've built stuff in my life. Okay, I've designed houses, I've built huge water projects, sheds, sidewalks, walls, yards. I don't own any of it anymore. I don't own any of it anymore. It pleased me at the time, but now it's gone. Someone else now owns them, and though it's highly unlikely, they appreciate them as much as I did at the time when I built them with my own hands and did those things. Solomon came to realize that even after all that he had accomplished, it was all pretty well pointless. Pretty well pointless. Now I realize that it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of humility here, but his list of accomplishments are actually much, much longer as chronicled in the book of 1 Kings. It, It was a very common practice among the ancient kings, and it still is today when you think about it, with our politicians and our our leaders to go on and on and on and on about all the things that they have practiced and the things that they've done in their tenure. But it's a rare thing for someone who has done so much as Solomon has to get done with it all and look back at it all and say, well, 
That was pretty pointless. That was pretty pointless. We don't hear too many politicians saying that after their term. I did a lot. That was pointless. Kind of interesting, huh? I want to back up a little bit to verse 9 where he says, My wisdom also stood by me. I think in this statement there is some truth there and there is some sorrow there. He also said in verse 3 that, that through his, this experiment of debauchery and pleasure that his mind was guiding him wisely. I, I, don't, I don't know what to think of that. I don't know that he could exactly, what he did could exactly be defined as wise, but rather as an awareness as while he was doing it, this is stupid. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of that? You know, I'm doing something, I'm, yeah, I'm, I just jumped off a cliff. The water is way down there. This is kind of stupid. This is kind of dumb. Okay? Um, I know better than this. I know this will end badly. I know that this is pointless. That kind of awareness could loosely be called wisdom, though it was certainly not the type of wisdom that made for pure actions. Okay? I want to be very careful at this point. Please hear me carefully at this point. And we need to be careful. I need to be careful in presenting this material as some sort of green light to go ahead and give the world a try. Go ahead and live it up. Just make sure you come back before midnight because that's not what I'm saying here. Okay? We've all heard testimonies from folks who talk about their previous lives, their pre-Christian lives on the wild side, and they kind of have this attitude and tone. I knew a pastor like this, and they have this attitude and tone that says, boy, those sure were the good old days, you know, but now I've come to settle down, and I'm just this old fuddy-duddy Bible-believing Christian. That isn't the kind of testimony we're getting from Solomon here, okay? This cost him a lot. It cost him a lot, and it cost him dearly. It should come with a disclaimer that says, do not try this at home, okay? He wrote this book to say, look, if you're thinking that, that you can have lasting happiness and fulfillment and purpose in this world alone, you're mistaken. You are mistaken. I've been down that road. I've tried it, and it is pointless. It's a chasing after the wind. It is all vanity. You cannot outdo me, he's saying. He's kind of bragging here a little bit. He says, I'm richer than you. I'm smarter than you. I've done more than you will ever do. I have more stuff than you can ever have. I've had more women than you will ever have. I've had more pleasure than you will ever have. And guess what? It's pointless. So why even try to find fulfillment and meaning in those things? Because they don't exist. Temporary happiness. There's a big difference between temporary happiness Long-term joy. Long-term joy. I question the wisdom in all of this because the women alone, okay? 700 wives, 300 concubines cost him dearly. You can only imagine in his relationship with God. It either cost him his relationship completely or at least it severely damaged his relationship with God. We look at 1 Kings chapter 11. Take a peek there. Uh, it's... Previous, it's after First and Second Samuel. Okay, First Kings chapter eleven. It says this. It says now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sid Sidonian, and the Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, "You shall not associate with them." Nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place, that's a temple, 
for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had two appearances with God, and he still turned away from him, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David, but I will tear it out of the hands of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Realize that Israel only had three united kings. Okay, Saul, David, Solomon. After Solomon, there was a great civil war and they were split the ten northern tribes, and then you had Judah and Benjamin, kind of a half-tribe hung in there. Okay, we know them as Judah. We know the northern tribes as Israel. They were never once united again because of, because of Solomon's failure. And that came to pass. That, that still exists. Okay? And just a couple of quick observations. Ashtoreth, she was the goddess of re- reproduction and, and, and the act of reproducing. Y'all know what that means. Okay? Do we not have plenty of temples built to her in our society? Absolutely. Moloch? Moloch? Worship of him involves child sacrifice. We wonder why it was an abomination and a detestable to God. Okay? Do we not have plenty of abortion clinics in our society murdering babies for the sake of the God of pleasure and convenience? Ticks me off. I imagine with 700 wives and 300 concubines, plenty of children were conceived. I wonder how many were destroyed, sacrificed, aborted in the name of convenience. They might crimp my style. Grow up! Grow up. It's a child, not a choice. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And yet our society has bought that lie more than anybody. We have murdered more innocent babies than Hitler ever dreamed of doing. Grow up. And we wonder why God is not blessing our nation. Come on now. Mark chapter 8. This is all New Testament stuff, too. This isn't just Old Testament. I think I got it up there. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it mean? Listen to verse 36, because this is what Solomon's talking about. This is exactly what he's talking about. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And forfeit his soul. For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Think about Solomon. You know, he didn't keep the commands of the Lord. It might have been wisdom, and sometimes it is wise, to look back at your failures and acknowledge them. Men, part of the men's fraternity, part of the study is taking responsibility. Taking responsibility. Admitting your failures. Okay? So in that, we can say that he was wise in this. He looked back at this awesome life 
And he could have kept that to himself, that he was really empty and hollow and it didn't mean anything, but he didn't do that. He decided to sit down with a pen and paper and write for us the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, look, guys, I could tell you that my life was great and wonderful and I did everything and had everything I ever wanted to do and could ever possibly desire, but I'm writing to tell you I did and it was pointless. It was pointless. It cost him his relationship with God. We don't know how that resulted, if God and his grace and mercy, because he tells us here at the end, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 through 14. I don't know if I got it up there or not. Yep, there it is. Okay, the conclusion, we looked at this last week, the end of this book. When all has been heard is fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person, even the richest, wisest king who ever lived for god will bring every act to judgment everything which is hidden whether it is good or evil solomon understood judgment everything he worked for would soon be for nothing his kingdom would be splintered and it would be left to enemies and fools just read the rest of first and second kings and first and second chronicles there were some incredibly foolish kings over the two tribes of israel after that time and something he alludes to there in verse 19 getting ahead of us you know he says that in chapter 2 verse 19 he says, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, the one that, that inherits all of his stuff. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. This too is vanity. Next point. Well, that's small. I apologize. Sinful pleasure with its short-term benefits often comes with long-term negative consequences. Sinful pleasure with its short-term benefits often comes with long-term negative consequences. Does this mean, some of you are like, man, are we going on like fundamentalist? Is this going to be like a really boring church? No, not at all. Does this mean that God does not want us to have any pleasure? Are we to be these stoic Puritans who shun all happiness and pleasure is evil? Absolutely not. God is the source of all things good. There's going to be a feast in heaven like nobody's business. As much as we cannot fathom Solomon's parties, neither can we fathom God's feast. God's party is perfect. It is sinless. It is pure. The joy never gets old. It's everlasting. You never get tired. You never get bored. God is the source of all good pleasure. God is the one who took Adam and Eve and put them in the perfect garden naked and said, multiply. How awesome is that? Think about that. Matthew chapter 22, verse 2 Jesus taught, he says, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Revelation chapter 19, uh, he says, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage supper of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. You want new stuff? Let's look at new stuff. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation verse 21. Verse 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle temple, same thing. The dwelling place of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Chapter 22, verse 10 through 17, he said to me, Do not seal up the words 
of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He said, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. Outside, the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolatries and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Are you ready for pure, holy, ecstatic, unbridled, we're talking Disneyland, Hawaii, skydiving, honeymoon, all mixed together rapturous pleasure? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Here's the thing. God knows a good time. God knows a good time. Pure pleasure is his idea. Uh, John Piper, former pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, wrote his great book, his, his pinnacle work, uh, called Desiring God. Desiring God. The Confessions of a Christian Hedonist, someone who finds all of his pleasure in God and the things that God has given him. You can't find it in this world. You can have sips of it. You can have glimpses of it. For all good things in this world are of him and from him and for him. Okay, But the wholeness of it, the fullness of it, the abundance of it, it's all in heaven to those who trust God through Jesus Christ and keep his commands. And keep his commands as Solomon tells us to do. So what do we do? Do we enjoy our stuff? We're going to get to that. He's, he comes back and says, enjoy your stuff. So don't think it's all negative. He says, enjoy it. Don't look for lasting pleasure there. It's just stuff. It's just stuff, and, and happiness is temporary. Joy is everlasting. My reward is everlasting, and that's what Jesus is saying. And, that, and that's what Solomon is saying. He's saying, look to God. Look to the gospel. And here's the thing about keeping those commands. Jesus did it through his sinless and righteous life. And he's willing to impute that righteousness to you. This is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? He also took the punishment for our sin. We don't know conclusively in Scripture whether he took the punishment of Solomon's sin, but he could have. It was his choice. Okay? And he took that and he bore the full wrath of that punishment upon the cross so we could be justified, so we could be made new, so we can be born again. And God satisfied with that perfect sacrifice, finding perfect pleasure in his son, rose him from the dead on that third day. A glorious resurrection, the first fruits of the grand resurrection. I want to encourage you and challenge you today, if you have not put your full faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, perhaps you've gone to other churches that have told you you've got to do all this religious stuff, recognize Jesus did it all on the cross. That's what it's about. Okay? You've got to be all like perfect and all of that, eh, that's not me. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I need grace. I'm pretty sure I need mercy, and that's just to go home with Lori, much less go to heaven. <laughs> much less to go to heaven. God gives us his grace. He gives us his mercy in abundance, okay? He gives us his mercy in abundance to those who would believe, place their faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross, and repent of their sins. That means you will find your joy, your pleasure in Jesus Christ completely. My favorite verse, Galatians 2.20, I say it all the time. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's Christ who still lives in me. 
The life that I now live in the flesh. Okay, wait a second. You've been crucified? He's dead to himself, his own desires, his own pursuit of pleasure. He's found it all in Christ. It says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up to me. I want to encourage you and challenge you on this Memorial Day to remember the one who fell in battle, the ultimate battle for you, Jesus Christ. Salvation can be yours freely. It is his gift. It is, it is his to give, and that's it. I want to encourage you to do so this day. We're going to come up and sing a song of response, a very fitting song of response, and we need as a church to sing it loudly because it's so true. We need to praise Jesus. But I want to encourage you, if you've not made this decision for Jesus Christ, I want you to do so today. You can come down and visit me, or you can wait till afterwards. I know some of y'all have been wanting to talk to me. I kind of had a crazy, hectic week last week. Call the office. I'm, I'm going to give Barb the day off tomorrow, and I got family coming, so I might be available a little bit, but probably not Tuesday. Get in there. Let's talk about this. This is so important. Let's talk about it. Okay, don't, don't leave here saying, I wonder. Come up here in a minute and make that appointment. All right? Make that appointment so we can talk about it and look at the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do love you. And we do praise you, Lord God. You are an awesome God and a mighty God, and you have given us all good things. Everything good we know, Lord God, let us be content. Let us find our pleasure in you. Let us be like Paul. I can, I can be content with a little. I can be content with a lot. It does not matter. I have Jesus. And that knowledge, that eternal knowledge, that heavenly promise, that glorious promise, far surpasses any trials, tribulations, shortcomings, longings I could ever have in this life. Lord God, we thank you for being the source of our true, lasting joy. Lord God, let us be Christian hedonists. Let us love greatly the things you have given us, some a lot, some a little, but let us love it. Let the poor man love what you have provided for him as much as the rich man. Lord God, let us find great pleasure in our husbands and our wives and in our family and in our children's lord god let us find great god-honoring pleasure in the work that we do all the days of our lives under the sun lord god let us seek to glorify you let us seek the things of your kingdom and your pleasure and your glory and your might first and all that other stuff <clears throat> all the stuff that madison avenue that'll be added to us if it needs to be. But we, if we have you, if we have the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross as our hope and our comfort and our shield, we have everything we could ever need. Lord God, we do love you and we do praise you and you deserve all of our praise and honor and glory. Lord God, send the Spirit upon this room at this time to perfect that praise and worship. We love you and we praise you. We ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and worship loudly our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.